morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, for those that you have joined us from all over the globe for this conference. Um, my name is Clint Gronin. I'm the CEO of Terrametric, and I'd like to thank EuroConsult for the opportunity to be here today um, and panel this discussion on agriculture, precision agriculture, and the incorporation of remote sensing. The first thing I'd like to do today is introduce the background of this panel and why we brought it uh, to fruition. So for its latest research titled EO for Ag, Earth Observation for Agriculture, EuroConsult has teamed up with Terrametric, a global business development firm focused on the geospatial and new space markets to provide an in-depth analysis on the global trends, vertical integration opportunities, and regional demand forecasted for Earth observation-based services and products addressing the agricultural sector. The two companies forecast that by 2029, the total agriculture market is expected to double in value to reach over $815 million. While that government-driven sales are foreseen to remain significant, the uptake of precision agriculture solutions within the private sector due to expected near-global broadband coverage is expected to be in the main catalyst behind the anticipated growth in the market. Precision agriculture incorporates a broad range of technology areas. In this context, it refers to supporting commercial agricultural supply chains by providing earth observation-based solutions and tools to back farming optimization processes, as well as research and development initiatives. For precision agriculture to evolve, connectivity is going to be key. Several outside factors, such as the expansion of automated analytics and the emergence of low earth orbit broadband constellations are expected to be a catalyst to momentous growth in reach and efficiency of existing precision agriculture capabilities and technologies, thanks to better connectivity overall. Drawing on these trends and technology developments, the total addressable market for precision agriculture is expected to equate to a little over $4 billion by 2029, according to the research forecast. And so with that in context of where we're going with this uh, panel, I'd like to introduce our panelists and then give each of them two to three minutes as an opportunity to help the audience understand more about their organization's role in the agricultural value chain and where remote sensing influences their services. Today, we'll begin uh, with these panelists. We have Zara Khan uh, from Planet, Fiametta Diani um, from the European Ganesh Agency, Grega Malinsky, uh, CEO of Synergize, and Ron Osborne, the CTO of Farmer's Edge. So with that, I'll begin with Ron Osborne and give him an opportunity to introduce himself, his company, and where they fit in the agricultural value chain. Thank you, Clint, and, and thank you, everyone. Uh, so, uh, Ron Osborne at Farmer's Edge, my role as Chief Technology Officer, um, I sit at the intersection between, between helping uh, the business identify and solve the most pressing problems that farmers face today. Um, Farmer's Edge is a, a global technology provider and, and risk management provider for farmers in the United States, Canada, uh, Latin America, South America, Eastern Europe and Australia with some emerging opportunities in, in Western Europe as well. And, and our, our focus really is helping farmers identify and understand risks that affect their business, that affect the crop, that affect the profitability of, uh, of, their, of their company faster and more accurately than ever before. Uh, remote sensing is a part of our product strategy. However, overall, precision agriculture and, and um, ag tech of, of today and of the future really is, is an integration of a variety of different data points. So Farmer's Edge, we focus on connectivity on the field, connectivity in the ground, connectivity in the air, obviously, or in space uh, from a remote sensing standpoint, satellite imagery, but also connectivity on machinery. So um, Farmer's Edge provides a digital infrastructure that's deployed out on farms on behalf of the farm. And we work with a variety of different agricultural stakeholders from some of the largest equipment manufacturers in the world to uh, seed and chemical manufacturers, of course, retail organizations, agronomists, and even in crop insurance and reinsurance and, and farm finance. So. Um, our, our, again, our focus is in identifying risks to the farm, helping farmers remain profitable. But in doing so, we're able to deliver on a promise of a healthy farm and, of course, a healthy planet through sustainability initiatives, 
traceability initiatives down to even the food and ingredients uh, businesses. So uh, thank you for having me on the panel and looking forward to some great questions. Clint. Thank you, Gregor. Uh, Ron, Gregor, would you like to introduce yourself and synergize, please? Sure, happy to. So, hi, I'm Gregor Milczynski. Um, co I'm a co-founder of Synergize, Tony here from Slovenia. We're probably best known for Sentinel Hub, which is a cloud API providing access to various satellite data sets like PlanetScope, Sentinel, Landsat, Modis, and the like. Um, we, I mean, our services are being used by hundreds of uh, precision agriculture application developers who then provide their analysis to tens of thousands of uh, farmers around the world. We process hundreds of millions of requests every month, uh, providing trillions of hectares of data to whoever needs that. Now, we are neither the data provider nor the application developer. We are somewhere in between making it easier for application developers to access the data in exactly the form that they like and need, like clipped to the farm, reprojected, uh, um, processed to the relevant vegetation index and the like, uh, without them having to bother about the data formats, the, the sensors of the satellite and, and so on. So we we'll simply make it easier for them. And by helping application developers, we actually also help the data providers because uh, we make it easier to uh, to use their data. Um, last but not least, by making it easier to build applications based on remote sensing data, we make this available to people around the world. And I believe in this way, we basically are growing the complete segment. So yeah, I'm looking forward for questions as well. And uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Grega. Um, Zara from Planet, would you mind introducing your, yourself and your firm as well? Hello, thank you. My name is Zara Khan. I'm here representing Planet Labs. Um, as many of you guys might know, we're a satellite Earth observation company. So we've developed the largest constellation of Earth observation satellites, currently 150 in orbit. And the excitement here is that we're gathering, gathering this unprecedented global data set, uh, which has massive commercial value, both in agriculture and other verticals. So traditionally, satellite imagery was really only available to governments and maybe some large enterprises. But our excitement today is that the innovation on the hardware and the innovation on the business model, more importantly, is what's allowing us to democratize access to the data. Um, and eventually, with, with the support of our downstream partners, um, empowering people and businesses around the world to really use that data. So that's key for us. And in general, there are sensors, they're collecting information everywhere, as um, the participants have said. It's really exciting for us to see individuals aggregating the data, layering it in, and drawing the insights. So I'm excited to contribute to the panel today. Very good. Thank you. And Fiametta? So I'm Fiametta Diani, and I'm here to represent the European Genesis Agency, or GSA. So the first question could be why you are here in this panel of Earth Observation if you do satellite navigation GNSS. So we'll try to answer this question. So uh, first of all, let me say what we do in uh, our agency. So we are providing the services uh, of uh, the satellite navigation system in Europe, EGNOS and Galileo. We ensure the security and the development of the market. Uh, and this is what I'm doing. So uh, we develop, we try to develop the market for our systems uh, via good market knowledge. We publish every two years our market report uh, that became a bit the reference worldwide for the GNSS downstream market. Uh, we create the demand. So we work with users to generate, uh, uh, to understand uh, what they need uh, to, to use uh, our systems even more. And then uh, we uh, support the creation of offers of products made in the European Union, in our case, uh, via uh, uh, involvement of companies, startups, SME, industry, uh, that answer this demand, uh, so innovative uh, products and solutions. And uh, uh, when I started to work at the GSA 10 years ago, I started with agriculture and I went in the field, literally, <laughs> to understand how our system were used. So I'm very happy to be back to discuss this topic today. But why we are here? So the GSA will become from uh, January next year, uh, uh, the EU agency for the space program. And we'll have uh, some new uh, tasks uh, that are assigned to us. And uh, these tasks are to develop the market also for our other program, uh, space program in Europe. 
and in particular the uh, Earth Observation Copernicus, uh, and we will have also a role in the part of telecommunication and connectivity. So I'm here to uh, understand what are the challenges uh, and how we can bring uh, Copernicus uh, uh, more to the to let's say end users, uh, business users, uh, that to what it is today, and what we can do to support the companies, the SME, the startups, and the ecosystem to get there. Thank you. So from there, now that we've had introductions, I'd like to have the opportunity to um, dive into some questions. We have a panel of experts from across the industry, and I think that we have the expertise to really dive into some subjects that can make remote sensing and precision agriculture grow. And one of the first things that, that I'd like to address is that is a question to Ron. Um, Ron, the agricultural value chain is very sophisticated, much more so than many remote sensing companies first assume when they enter the space. In the last 10 years, the technology ceased from being a limiting factor to adoption. Um, we've seen it really break through and be distributed widely. There have been some breakthroughs and as, some, and as well as some challenges to adoption. What do you think, um, what, what is the most significant effect that remote sensing has had on agriculture today? Uh, great question, Clint. So, um, but a couple of things that you touched on, I think are, are worth revisiting a little bit is that uh, when, when we're talking about remote sensing, the, there's been some amazing advancements, obviously, with the, the spacecraft. Um, and, uh, and I know that we'll have some great panel discussion on that today as well. But Farmer's Edge, as an example, we really live in that last mile, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a, an orchestra of technologies that have to work out really, really well in order for the last mile, in which case the farmer, the retailer, the agronomist, uh, a number of different partners, um, in order for, that to, for them to consume that. And so by, by the, the sheer nature of agriculture that is rural, and so I, I think some of, the, um, some of the advancements that are worth noting are actually in just internet access. And we, we take those things for granted, especially in, in parts of North America or in the US and other parts of Europe and the world, but there are still huge portions of the world that still struggle with actually just having internet access. And I know there's, there'll be some fun discussion along that as well, using satellites for that. Farmer's Edge's focus again is, is on that last mile. So what we've had to see is we've had to see enhancements in, uh, uh, 3G, 4G access to mobile devices. People are looking to consume the insights from remote sensing, not just at their desk, but actually when they're out um, walking, when they're out in the tractor cab, when they're when they're going about their day um, producing a crop. And so the the actual infrastructure, I think, is still is still an issue, but it's also seeing some dramatic improvements as well. The most significant effects that I th think that remote sensing has had in, in agriculture is it is now in a position where it can be better integrated into all of the other data pipelines. So in, in some respects, it's just about having access to it. It's just about being able to enjoin that, that data, this important data from space as an example along with all of the other data sets that are that are truly uh, required as well. Space, we can tell a lot from space, but I, I personally look at it as it's a it's several important chapters of the entire novel that farmers read and, and write. And so the 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 first impact is just having access to it and being able to join it with the machine data, with the weather data, with the the soil data and all of the agronomic agronomic data sets. But in many respects, the, the most significant impacts are just about awareness and being able to scale, being able to see from space um, a, a picture and or, or uh, derivatives where that farmer can get a better understanding of, okay, here's what's going on, on on my field over the last several weeks or over the last month. But tying that data in to all of the other data sets so they truly get the, the complete picture. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, yeah, agriculture has really become a data heavy industry. Um, and I think that the Farmer's Edge uh, platform really speaks to that and your, your network of how much data can be integrated to make decisions. 
um, and what you can learn from those combined uh, data sets that you can't learn from any one data set. So, so thank you for that. Um, one of the things that I recall from the early days of the explosion of remote sensing into agriculture was we began by sending out data on hard drives and then it became FTP and then it eventually moved into a cloud-based environment. And Grega, you mentioned that, that your um, firm hosts many data sets in a cloud-based environment and serves that out. And eventually that makes it to the end user, um, which the end user in this case would be the grower or the farmer. What are some of the ways that you see that those growers benefit from that remotely sensed data? Well, I think that the, the, the basic promise uh, that, the, that they get is that they will be able to get an insight in their fields um, without going to the field, like that they will see the state of vegetation uh, or the state of how their, their crops are growing with, I mean, without actually being there, or maybe even see the things that they cannot see by themselves uh, simply because they don't, I don't know, look into the in near infrared uh, spectrum. And so that's, that's the core thing around it, right? The, the funny thing I find is that in most cases, though, what they are looking at is an NDVI. I mean, uh, the funny thing, though, is because this NDVI is something that we're looking at for looking at for decades already. Um, still, people and farmers they are willing to pay to actually look at the NDVI, which means that this is actually already providing value for them, right? Now, in some cases, it is just an NDVI of uh, existing uh, of today or yesterday, which kind of gives you an impression of. Uh, what is the state now but most often what you see is kind of a, a, a analysis of the again the typically the ndvi over a period of time which will give you the feeling of which parts of the field are growing better or worse and therefore you'll be able to adjust your i don't know fertilizer or whatever uh, you're after um to to basically accommodate this thing and i mean again People are, even though this is super simple, uh, at least for me, I, I, people are willing to pay for that. Now, what I think is happening though is that this is becoming such a commodity. I mean, now, especially with uh, all the free data that is available, um, I, I think that people are now pushing this onward. Uh, and, and I mean, the nice thing is that you have the satellite data becoming uh, better available, you have more of it, and that's an important thing. But also that the technology uh, that you need to, to, to work with this data is becoming more and more accessible, many of it open source, right? So what I think is happening now is that the companies are trying to develop kind of an early warning system or even a prediction system, right? Which will tell you, this is what will happen uh, um, if you don't do this and that. Um, and I mean, I've seen some examples already um, with uh, various applications where they already go in this direction, but it's still, I mean, it's difficult. And I guess one of the reasons why it's difficult is that it's super complicated to do these kind of models that work globally or even regionally, right? You really need to, you really need to adjust them to um, like a small local uh, situation. And if you then uh, combine this with the fact that the whole market is just appearing, so that means that when you have a solution, you will not necessarily have already the, the, the client buying that, this kind of makes it even more challenging to, to develop these kind of models. And I, I mean, what I think is important is that uh, um, we all play along, meaning that the technology providers, the data providers, because to do that, you need data. And sometimes you need a lot of data before you generate any revenue whatsoever, right? And um, here it's super useful if we can use the data um, without uh, making a significant capital investment, we meaning the application developers, right? So that they can develop and test the models and then they start selling the, 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 the their derivatives to others. And I think that's slowly evolving uh, because, yeah, the, the data is becoming a commodity, the technology is becoming a commodity, uh, and so on and so on. Yeah, I agree. Um, one of the things that we, we like to think about when it comes to precision agriculture, agriculture in general, is that many people think that it's all about the farmer but as we mentioned in our introduction agribusiness is this huge value chain that incorporates everything from insurance companies finance organizations um, growers of course um, agricultural retailers chemical and seed suppliers and one of the things that i've seen happen across the industry is that farm management software 
has bridged the gap among all of those different organizations. And so what I'd like to do on the next question, I, I'd like to address it to back to Ron because they incorporate data sets from so many different organizations along with the remote sensing data is when you think about farm swap software and the adjacent technology platforms and how much data they actually ingest, um, why is that? And across the value chain, what, what are some examples of specific problems that, that you're solving, not just for the farmer, but across the industry? Well, I think there's a, and you, you hit the nail on the head, Clint, that agribusiness is deeply connected and whether it's food or fuel or fiber, the, 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 the crops that a farmer produces you know, are consumed globally in nearly every facet of, of our existence. And the, some of the biggest impacts that you find when you connect partners into a single chain of data, right, into this, when, when farmers are comfortable sharing their information with with third parties that they trust when they're comfortable with that. Some of the things that, some of the, the benefits are realized through efficiencies and through logistics. The farmer is always a, a, a recipient of the benefit by having a better relationship, say with an equipment manufacturer. But in, in some instances from when these data sets are all connected, as an example, a, an equipment manufacturer might be, might be better able to uh, manufacture parts and and support pieces of equipment on time simply by knowing when uh, when a, a given surface area of the planet when a farm is probably going to be harvested right so having the the data from the field having some data from space having data from the machines really gives a supply chain benefit to the OEM to say if I'm in just in time if I'm doing just in time fulfillment on supply chain and in parts manufacturing then I can be reaching out to my dealer network and saying, we, we need to prepare for these types of parts because we are seeing right now by working with our customers that there's a high probability that they're going to be needing these parts in, in this, this time period. The same thing comes in, in play with, with insurance and farm finance. When you have, again, the, and our, our focus clearly is on enjoining all of these different data sets and producing uh, producing derivative insights that, that use remote sensing and a variety of other data. But from a farm finance and from an insurance perspective, it, it puts the power in the hand of the farmer to be able to share his or her information with third parties and create actually better products that are priced more effectively that the farmer can actually afford to protect the crop. But in doing so, having this information creates efficiencies at the at the reinsurance level, at the insurance level, at the agent level, at the at the bank level, everybody wins through efficiencies and through removing frictions. Now, it's it's not easy to do because of all of the the complexity of the data, the connectivity, and, and more importantly, making sure that the trust of the farmer is always rock solid, that his or her data is is only being accessible to third parties that he or she enables. But the the efficiencies really touch every element of, of agribusiness when that farmer trusts the, the, the platform provider and can uh, expose these interesting derivatives to the people that he or she does business with. It's about efficiencies, it's about logistics, it's about removing unnecessary frictions. I guess I'll put it that way. And in doing so, everybody really builds a better relationship. Yep, for sure. The, the interconnectedness connectedness of the market, I think, is often overlooked, especially from around the world where we have traditional defense and aerospace companies that are entering into the agriculture market. Understand that com Understanding that complexity is definitely key. Um, I'd like to switch directions a little bit now. Um, and my next few questions are going to be directed towards Zara and Fiametta. Um, as we're thinking about how government plays a role in developing this market further um, and how that interacts with the commercial world. So for Zara, the Copernicus Earth Observation Program has had a tremendous impact on um, the industry from top to bottom. And um, as we know, that data is supplied um, with taxpayer funded dollars so that everyone has access to it. I actually have a very difficult time calling it free data as many do because we all paid for it um, in somehow in some way. But when we think about how that affects the commercial industry um, and the development of downstream commercial applications, 
How has that wide availability of taxpayer funded data affected the commercial industry? Thank you, Clint. I'd like to start with a quick overview of our relationship with the European Space Agency. We have a really close tie. We're a Copernicus contributing mission, and we're also a third party mission. So to start with, there's very strong ties at all levels with ESA. Um, what's exciting about the Copernicus program, and I mean, it's, it's really phenomenal how they've really established a baseline of data out there in the market. It's feeding the commercial markets because companies are able to start developing applications and programs and other types of solutions that they might have been inhibited if there was only a commercial market out there. So Greg had mentioned earlier that it would be nice if there was some kind of like a sandbox environment or a place where people can experiment. What's nice for us at Planet is when people know that they need higher frequency or higher resolution, they've had the chance to test that. And so having um, satellite imagery publicly available is, is really beneficial for the commercial market. It also keeps us on our toes to innovate. So as the Sentinel missions are really fulfilling a need, we, we go a step further and we start thinking about, okay, so what else could we provide to the market to create value, which is our ultimate mission. Um, what's exciting is we've been working with our engineers and developing a new solution that is actually integrating public data sets like Sentinel and Landsat and fusing them and harmonizing so that we're even moving towards a sensor agnostic world. That, that's kind of the next level. Um, it's not yet a commercially available product. We announced it last month. But what is exciting, as you said, is that the public missions are really establishing a baseline and, and moving the entire industry forward. And we're excited to be a part of it. Great, thank you. And Fiametta, along the same lines, when we're thinking about Earth observation data that's been publicly provided, um, and how that could fit in with some of your background in navigation data. Can you talk a little bit more about how that can be used to a greater advantage of precision farming? And maybe what are some of the advantages of this combined data set? Um, yes, thanks uh, for the question. Um, so when we, we address uh, uh, synergies between navigation and earth observation, agriculture always emerges as a, let's say, classic uh, case even if we think the potential is still uh, big to grow. But the, let me maybe quote what are the main applications of GNSS in agriculture so I can explain where uh, they can work together and give a value. So the classical application that was born in the last years uh, is uh, the tractor guidance. So I help to the, to the growers to um, uh, use their tractor in a more efficient way. So to save fuel and to save uh, pesticide uh, with the one meter uh, accuracy, absolute accuracy that, uh, that our system offer, we can arrive to a 30 centimeter pass to pass. And this permits them to save uh, um, fuel and fertilizer and, and other chemicals. Um, but uh, from this, uh, there is a step forward that is the variable rate uh, technology. This is uh, foreseen uh, by 2029 to become the first application of GNSS in agriculture. And in this case, uh, is a, a case where we can use combined uh, uh, together earth observation, uh, local sensor, and GNSS. And we require also very accurate positioning. So with earth observation, we have uh, uh, periodic data. Um, and uh, we can uh, uh, navigate in real time uh, uh, the variable rate uh, to provide the necessary operation in a very precise way. Uh, also, we see synergies uh, for the other application of GNSS that are in, not in operation but in monitoring. For, exam for example, in uh, soil uh, moisture, uh, we can uh, have uh, a prescription maps with the earth observation data and we can then with GNSS guide the operations uh, for a more efficient uh, irrigation or other kind of application. Uh, of the uh, in this field so we think that there is a potential uh, for a combined use uh, and the variable rate technology is expected to become the preeminent uh, application in our in our field and we also do expect a growth in the revenues in the gnss used for agriculture uh, worldwide uh, up to three billion so we think that there is a huge potential given the forecast that you gave uh, to to use the two technologies uh, in uh, in the same solutions uh, for the final users. 
Yeah, I, I agree. All of this technology is is working together to increase the, the value of what we do in the field as well as the overall size of the market. Um, and as we think about all of this data coming into play, I do want to take a second before we start to uh, dive into the third data set, which maybe it's not a data set, but the connectivity around the world, to maybe address um, the number of satellites that are starting to make it into the market. We have governmental satellites, which have been providing tremendous amounts of data. We have mega constellations like the Planet Labs constellations. But over the next decade, we're expecting to see um, over 900 satellites launched um, in the Earth observation space. And so my next question is for uh, for Zara. Um, as we see these tremendous amount of satellites launched, how do you think that's going to affect the commercial business from a data supply standpoint, pricing, licensing, all of these different components? It's a great question, Clint. I think that the reality is nobody knows fully, but one thing that you're hearing again and again on the panel is, Data is one part of it. Um, the adoption, the integration, and, and the behavior change at the end that's required is really critical. Um, what will really make us understand if this commercial market's ready to thrive is, is how is that data delivered? How is it integrated? Where's the fusion components that we can kind of start thinking about right now? So I believe there's going to be a lot more movement in synthetic aperture radar, SAR data, both in the commercial market and maybe even uh, more in the public markets. I could see hyperspectral um, getting more traction. We still have to see product market fit here and understand how it's, again, integrated to make that final decision valuable. And I, I don't know if I fully answered the question clearly, but we're definitely thinking about this at all levels. And as you get more data, it, you just need to make sure you're not burdening the end users and, and the downstream players. It, it really needs to prove value and every incremental data set must prove that it's it's worth the investment. So that, that's what we'll see the, the commercial market really step up is proving where, where the true value is, seeing more partnerships, seeing more integration, and hopefully seeing less images and more insights. That That's what I, I hope all this brings to is more competition and more, more growth. Exactly. Competition often brings higher value products and services to the market, and it causes everyone to step it up to the next level. Um, as I think about um, this, this piece of where we are today, you made a really good point about moving in and expanding into other data sets like radar and also into hyperspectral. I'd like to come back and visit that one, but with the licensing, with the with the data sets that we have today, one of the things that I consistently hear from both sides of the industry, from operators and from um, the side of the, the users of the data in agriculture, I, I'd like to address a question to Greg, because he, he deals in both um, pieces of that. When, when we're working with both commercial data and the, the subsidized data, government subsidized data, Using the, the free data sets, it's easy to grab it, use it, create processes, create algorithms from that, and develop downstream services. But we also see from the commercial side, one of the things I hear pretty consistently is licensing can be a challenge. Licensing commercial data sets versus using the, um, uh, the, the taxpayer-funded data sets. How do you see that evolving, and what are some things you would like to see from the, the commercial world on licensing? I mean, um... It's basically the, 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 the consumers or users, they got spoiled, right? With the free data and, I mean, good quality data from Sentinel. And now they expect to get something similar really from uh, commercial providers as well. And I mean, one just before going into the pricing, there's even a, a technical challenge, right? That most of the commercial providers are not um, like easily able to provide uh, the, the weekly air hive of data um, for any place in the world right you need to go into tasking so i mean, even that is is already an issue but then yeah the 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 the, the, the licensing or the the data the business models probably this is the really the challenging thing how i see it is that most of the satellite providers uh, at least the the old ones they basically were built around defense and with with defense the cost uh, was not an issue. The only thing that was important is to get as good image as possible immediately or as soon as possible, right? This is what the business was, was built upon. And everything else, I mean, everything else, a part of the defense was kind of the, the error margin there that they tried to kind of uh, build on, but they didn't really focus them. 
And uh, now, going with agriculture, it is completely different business. I mean, uh, having the image immediately, that's not such an issue, right? I mean, you are okay if you get an image, let's say, on a weekly basis, like with Sentinels, that's fine. Uh, but what you need is really this um, stability, consistency, that you get the data regularly and that that uh, that this is not too costly right i mean the problem is that if you want to get the data regularly in most cases you need to go for tasking model uh, and i mean tasking models are super expensive because obviously the providers they need to uh, um, task satellites specifically for a user and this i mean this typically uh, for at least average uh, um, user and user being the, even the the application developers not necessarily the farmer is just too much right um, then the, the other issue that uh, you often or almost always come upon is the minimum order size. I mean, the, um, the, 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 the satellites in the past or the satellite imagery in the past was sold by hundreds of square kilometers. I mean, typically minimum size, I don't know, 100 square kilometers. 100 square kilometers is what, 10,000? No, uh, what, 10,000 hectares, right? Something, I mean, it's a huge amount of, for, and you need a homogeneous area. So that's something that typically doesn't work because immediately you are paying for data that you don't need. And I mean, here I have to congratulate really to Planet uh, where they established this uh, um, pay-per-use model really where you can you can clip the data to a specific polygon and the, the minimum order sizes are super small, right? I mean, uh, going beyond the, uh, or below the, the square kilometer. So you really can, I mean, you can get almost what you need, even if it's a bit more, but you, you, you can go there. Um, and one other thing that is important is that typically you need the data, not just for now, but you need the data for the past as well. And again, there are just uh, some, providers which make it possible to actually get the data for the last year for any uh, um, any uh, uh, any area that you're looking for right so that's that's a challenge and then you I mean then you get into the the technical issues that um, most of the uh, the providers they still work with emails right you need the data you send email and then they will put the data on the FTP I mean this doesn't work any longer if you're working with tens of thousands of, of orders. I mean, this is what, what, what we do, right? We really uh, manage tens of thousands of orders. And it, I mean, we, we earn, a, I don't know, a dollar with each, with each of these or even less. And you cannot do that if you have to send one email, right? So now this going to the APIs, this is essential. And again, I think that here, uh, Planet is making a really important steps showing how things could be done. And then the other uh, providers are somehow following on that. Now, um, beyond the paper use uh, and the, 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 so the minimum order size, one other thing that is, that is kind of problematic is actually just the licensing because um, typically you have the licensing for internal use and licensing for, uh, I don't know, the, the uh, resellers. And in, in this new world, there are many players, right, coming from the data to the final users. Uh, I know there is a data provider, then maybe it's us who do the basic processing, then there is an application developer who does the derivative, and then there is the end user, or maybe there is even someone in between. And it's, it's even difficult to get a license which covers this flow, even though the end result is still one user paying for one uh, product and using it for internal need. And that's, I mean, that, that, is, that is something that kind of is a legal thing, which should be straightforward, but yet it becomes, uh, it becomes an issue. Right. Just to mention that all of it really is, is coming around trust, uh, because, I mean, if there is trust built between the data providers and the intermediates, then I think all of these things can be done so much smoother and then things will resolve. And I hope that with Sentinel Hub, we are kind of making uh, it easier for everyone to use. Thank you. That's a, that's a very complex subject and one that we see across the industry. Um, and we're at this inflection point where the way you order data is changing, the way that you choose the data is changing. I mean, in, in the world today, I still see companies that receive orders by fax machine. And I also see companies that are just at the forefront of technology with a console and an API. So these two things were at a, at a point in this industry when we're starting to emerge into much easier licensing and, and ordering. 
We have 10 minutes left um, in the panel. And so I do have a question from the audience. Uh, this one comes from Ana Maria. And um, it's directed more towards the downstream users of the data, I believe. It, the question is, what are the user needs for precision farming in terms of temporal resolution, radiometric resolution, and accuracy in order to identify the right sideline mission that can really answer these needs? Um, I'd like to give that opportunity to someone that's really close to the grower or works with them closely, maybe. What do they need for precision farming? I suppose um, I'll, I'll answer uh, briefly. Um, I'll, I'll steer away from some of the topics regarding, uh, say, a signal to noise ratio and radiometric calibration and things like that. Obviously, the highest quality sensors, I mean, Sentinel has, Sentinel has been a, a gold standard that I think many people um, look to and aspire to. And so from a, from a sensor quality standpoint, um, there's, a, there's a never ending appetite for the highest quality products out there. But in terms of uh, how that's consumed, the temporal resolution is important. But, but if, we're, if we're all being honest, there, there's only so much, um, call it a photosynthetic activity in a plant over a given period of time. And so uh, to Gregor's points earlier that cost and uh, uh, cost and frequency and things become truly a, a function of what is the end customer willing to pay for? And what, what is that, what does the actual market look like? From our perspective, there, there's, there really is a, a, there can be a point of diminishing returns, but, um, but it, it's, it's really about making sure that the farmer has the most updated fused data sets that they can make decisions from to understand understand risks. Um, when uh, um, I guess when when we're looking at solving these problems, you can't you can't take clouds for granted, right? And so SAR is SAR is part of that answer. SAR is a part of the equation. But clouds come into play, and which is one of the reasons why we we um, we look at this more holistic data set at the farm level to try to always be there to answer questions agronomically that something from space might be prohibited uh, from getting from, from cloud cover. But um, farmers are looking for, and Greg mentioned this too, they're looking for historical data, right? They're looking to see um, how did, how did my, my crop evolve over the last four or five years? What am I seeing from a topography for drainage issues, things along those lines? So there is, a, there is importance to have the historical data and there's important to have it as 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 frequently as as feasible, but again, costs um, are at the at that last mile at the kitchen table with the farmer sitting there asking them, is is this you know can they afford this investment? That's an entirely different question about commodity prices. Um, but uh, but I, I think there's some really interesting technologies. We're seeing some wonderful constellations put up from a variety of different players, and, and so I think from from our perspective, it's it's trying to find the right product mix. And that's, that's uh, we don't see that changing. Right. Well, we, we're down to five minutes and, and thank you for answering that for the audience, Ron. Um, we're down to five minutes. And so I wanted to come back and address kind of the, the quintessential last question of, of most panels in the technology world. So we've seen a tremendous amount of growth and change over the last 10 years, um, and even more change in the last five of that 10. As we think about where the size of these constellations and the frequency of data are starting to push, and we have more and more data available, are we pushing into SAR? Are we pushing into hyperspectral? Um, these type of questions are on the horizon for where remote sensing is gonna be in ag in the next five years. Um, I'd like to have one quick short answer from everyone when we think about these things. Um, we'll start with uh, Fumetta, if that's okay. What do you think we're going to be talking about five years from now in agriculture and remote sensing technology? Yes, so first of all, I think we have to solve the challenges we have in front of us to, to really get to this potential that you said in the beginning. And uh, from our experience uh, in GNSS, uh, the challenge are uh, easy to use, uh, affordable price to democratize the technology, involvement of the new generation of farmers, uh, of growers, uh, because we, are, we have in front of us an uh, aging uh, population uh, of uh, farmers around the world uh, and in Europe as well. And uh, um, 
We think that the integration of technology to give end-to-end -end solution that can be affordable and easy to use uh, is uh, what we do expect in five years from now. And this will permit to, un permit to unlock the potential we have in front of us. I, I agree. Um, Zara, from the, from the commercial operator standpoint, you've seen technology move probably at a tremendous rate in a very fast moving organization. What do you think about the next five years? It's hard to predict the future. Planet was hardly around uh, 10 years ago, so who knows what comes next. But I think what, what I would find really inspiring is if there's not only uh, commercial market movement, but agriculture has a very strong government role. Um, so maybe if there's government systems that are set up to support digital solutions. I could see this through subsidy programs or through government incentives or insurance programs. That that would be, for me, really inspiring is if you can get all the entire sector moving with, with broader government participation. I think if we take a commercial-only approach, we're missing some of the largest opportunities, uh, not only just at a grower level, but just as an overall system level. And you see that coming with things like sustainability now and certain legislation. I could see many different forms that it takes, um, and that would be something very exciting. I can talk about the hardware and technology side. Th that's also very interesting. But but if I were to think of like system level changes, I would see that public private um, inter interplay really advancing in the next five years. Yeah, I think we're going to see more and more of that as time goes on, and we start to see more government sensors come online, more commercial sensors come online. The the need to work well together is is going to be tremendously important. Grega, um, where do you see us in five years from, from this standpoint? I mean, five years ago, Sentinel really started, right? By then, I mean, at the time, people were using Sentinel data or satellite data really just for research mostly. And now everyone is using that. So I believe that uh, there will be so much of data available in five years that it will not, not longer be a question of what you'll be using. You'll be simply using everything that is available. Uh, mostly focusing on the free side, I mean, the, the, the governmental data sets, because this will be, uh, I mean, simply most uh, affordable. And then you will drop in the machine learning in the mix, doing some super resolution and all these things, so that you do the modeling, and then the commercial data sets will, will come handy to basically improve the quality and to fine tune for specific issues, which you cannot, I don't know, monitor with 10 meter resolution or something like that. Right. And Ron, uh, we have one minute left. What do you see is, is where we'll be talking, what we'll be talking about in the next five years? You know, I have to agree with all of the panelists. I think that um, if we're looking at, if we're looking at the future, I see, we see a number of existing providers expanding their operations. We see a number of legacy and, and incumbents, even in the defense industry and, and others, um, uh, really dramatically expanding their constellations and their their infrastructure to be able to serve out agribusiness. Um, I think from, from Greg's point, I, I could not agree more. In fact, that's that's really the essence of what our commercial focus is, is, is uh, receiving data sets from a variety of different sources, uh, leveraging as much of the infrastructure that, that we all pay for, Clint, as you described earlier, um, some of that, that free infrastructure and working with key providers to, um, to join data sets in with machine learning, with the ground truthing on that, that we actually focus on, of course, at that last mile, with the weather data and soil data actually from soil sensors in the ground and then on the machines and, and basically tying all this information in so that we can collectively uh, produce and, and create derivatives for farmers and agribusiness around the world that, that ties all of it together. Very good. And I, I see this, this technology growing tremendously um, and becoming somewhat of a, of a base level of information that's when we get to a level of a certain amount of sensors that are consistent, um, that we can build as base level information anywhere in agriculture all around the world, incorporating new and changing data sets. I think that remote sensing is going to become um, and remotely sensed data will be foundational data rather than the novelty that it was five and 10 years ago. And we'll be talking about it as the base of, of everything that we do. So with that said, um, we've run out of time today. Um, I wanna thank all of the panelists for joining us. Um, it's been great having you on here and helping us understand the insights of your business 
and how we can continue to grow um, this very large market around remote sensing. And thank you all for all that you do in the agricultural sector, um, helping us grow more food, safe food, um, and have that food feed the world as we as our needs increase. So thank you all. Um, I appreciate that you all have attended and have a great day.